in that couch, just thinking, <laughs> this is fun. I'm enjoying myself immensely. I, oh, that would be great, thanks. Not realizing I actually had to work. Gee whiz. All right. Hello, everybody. It's been a long time in person. I know. Yeah. I've gotten so used to doing it online too, because you just sit there and all of that. I apologize in advance. The speaker's right by my stomach and I have not eaten today. Oh, I was sitting there, I was thinking, oh no, <laughs> starting to make the noises. Of course, of course. Uh, better. <laughs> oh, so. This is the month of curiosity. That's what we're talking about. That's the global theme. And little known fact, when I took a values test, you know those values tests where you list all the values and toning them down and which one's most important and then you get your top three or top five. My number one was curiosity. So I was like, this is great. This is actually a talk that I really am born to do and I'm really excited to do it. And I wanna talk about the three gifts of curiosity. Spoiler alert, they are questions, okay? I'm just telling you that ahead of time. Just get yourself ready for it. And all questions, but they're questions that lead us deeper and that kind of lead us on the way. Um, now, let me start by reading a little something. This is from a book that was published years ago in the 90s, early 90s, called The Earth House. And I looked it up and it's out of print. In fact, it's really hard to find. And it's tiny print. Uh, so she said this, though, in this book called The Earth House. She, she tells the story. She says, suppose you get up one morning and you go downstairs and you find that the book you were reading the night before is gone. Mm -hmm. You think you, maybe you've misplaced it and you look all over the house, but you can't find it. Very puzzling. You go on with your day. The next morning you go downstairs and you find that the lamp on that end table by the couch is gone. Oh my gosh, this is alarming. You check all the doors, they're locked. You check all the windows, they're locked too. And yet the lamp is gone. And you go on with your day. And then the next morning you come downstairs and you discover that the couch has disappeared. <laughs> the couch, a blank place where it once was. This is terrible. You're being robbed. What should you do? Well, there are several possible courses you could take. One, you could call the police. Two, you could call everyone you know who has a key to your house. <laughs> Three, you could install a burglar alarm system. But the answer that makes the best sense is this. Stay up all night and watch very carefully. And it's the same with your life. If something's missing, or if you suspect that there is something that needs to change, that something's going on, the best way to get to the bottom of it is to stay awake. I love that. I read that back in the 90s, and I've kept it ever since. I knew it would come in handy for a talk. I just didn't know it would be 40 years. Can you be a little louder, closer to the mic? Online is having a little bit of time. Okay, yes. I can. Let me set this over here then uh, so I can see this. So curiosity then leads us to staying awake so we can pay attention to what is actually going on in our life. And when we do it as part of our spiritual path, it's even richer because it leads us even deeper into our life. It takes us places that we never thought we would go, both literally and figuratively, which I'll get to. Listen to these great quotes. I wrote these down to share. This is from Richard Rohr, famous yeah, Catholic uh, priest and um, great spiritual teacher. He says this, pain not transformed is transmitted. Pain not transformed is transmitted. And then Carl Jung, the great psychotherapist said this, the one who looks outside dreams but the one who looks inside awakens mm -hmm. and joseph campbell who wrote you know who created the idea of the hero's journey or mm -hmm. put it all together he said this the cave 
you fear to enter holds the very treasure you seek. Mm -hmm. So just for fun, I put those all together and I came up with this. When we stop looking for answers on the outside and begin looking within, that very inner cave, which we might even fear to enter, we can take the pain we feel and transmit it into the treasure, the very treasure we need the most, the treasure we want the most, and in so doing, we awaken. That's what curiosity does. That's what curiosity does. So curiosity for me is a superpower. Mm -hmm. And the way that we unlock that superpower is by using questions. That's how we access our superpower of curiosity. And I have three questions for you that I think are brilliant. Of course, because I'm saying them, I think they're brilliant. And um, they are really questions that help us to go not just to the entrance of that cave within, but to go in so that we can find the treasure. Now, years ago, I was in a car driving Paulo Coelho, who wrote a book called The Alchemist. This oh, yeah. is back in the 90s. Wow. And I remember saying to him, um, you know, how do, Paulo, how do we know where to go in life? <laughs> a little question, you know, while I'm driving. <laughs> Answer this while I'm driving. And he said, well, Joel, and he said it in this Brazilian accent, which I won't do. He said, there are signs, symbols, and omens everywhere. And I said, oh, okay. How do I see the signs, <laughs> symbols, and omens? And he said, just become curious about what's already there. Mm -hmm. The signs are already there. Just become curious about them. So we're going to discuss three questions that help you to see the signs, symbols, and omens that are already there that open up the entrance into the inner cave where the treasure lies. Now, before I give you the three questions, I'm going to tell you what to do with these three questions, the two things, two ways that you can process the questions, okay? I want to give you that before I give you the questions so that as I'm giving you the questions, you don't think, so what do I do with that? There are two ways that I usually process. Thank you. <laughs> I process the questions. One is, have you, how many of you have heard of labyrinths? I know, haven't you even had a labyrinth here in... In the back? Dana. Oh, Dana. Okay. So a labyrinth is a, is a um, maze. It's almost like a sacred maze that you go in and it leads you through different quadrants before you get into the center. But it's movement. It's a way of moving. And I remember years ago, I went to a labyrinth that was at a convent in St. Louis. And um, it had a little sign at the front. And it said, enter with a question, leave with the answer. And that's what exactly happened to me. I entered with a question and I went through the labyrinth and walked all the way into the center, sat there, received an answer, and then walked out with that answer. Now, we don't all have access to labyrinths, but a walk, just a walk around your neighborhood can become a sacred labyrinth. And I'll have an example of that in a little bit. So walking. Make your walk a sacred labyrinth where you ask a question, go for a walk, don't put on your earbuds, don't chat with a friend, just go on your sacred labyrinth walk wherever you are at. Two, you can journal, you can ask for guidance. Now, some of us are in the Artist Way group that I'm leading right now, the Write for uh, Life group uh, by Julia Cameron, who wrote The Artist Way. In a book that she wrote previous to that called Seeking Wisdom, she talks about her tool of guidance, okay? So this is guidance. I always called them, and I've always taught them as soul letters, but she has a little different take on them. She says this, I began to pray on the page. Please guide me about such and such. I would pray listening and then for a response and then writing what I heard. Prayer can be a dialogue, not a monologue. It was a conversation with me talking to God and God talking back to me. As I experimented with this practice, I found that what I heard back would prove to be gentle, accurate, and useful. This is one of the main ways that I talk to God to this day. Guidance is a Q&A process by which I lead my life. What should I do about this, I ask, and then I listen for a response, pen in hand, pen to the page, I hear a reply, and I jot it down. 
Very often the answers are simple, simpler than I would have thought. I will refer to myself in these pages as little Julie, LJ. That's what she calls herself when she poses a question. I pose a question. I will listen for the answer and write the response. I have learned to listen to my guidance almost constantly over the years, and I've come to trust it completely. I may not believe it in the moment. My human mind may say, but what about this? Or what if that? But it has always proven to be steady and useful. What we hear back will often be surprisingly simple and straightforward. Allow yourself to experiment with this tool as you ask questions. But Julia, I'm sometimes asked, what if it's just your imagination and not God that's answering these <laughs> questions? I reply, if it's just my imagination, it's still good. And my imagination is far wiser than I would have ever thought. So those are two ways, the questions I'm about to talk about, those are two ways you can process them. Go take the question for a walk or sit down and write the question and allow that higher self to answer. First question, why are you here? I've taught this before. Reverend Michelle recently said in a talk, she said, I've, I've said this many, many times, but it bears repeating sometimes. These are the things that we learn from over and over. And each time we learn it, we take it deeper. Why are you here? Or why is this situation in my life here? Why is this person here? Why is this experience happening to me? Now, if we just take it from a place of victimhood, we get you know, well, why are you here? You know, it's kind of that place. And when we do that, a lot of people today talk about being triggered by things, you know, oh, something triggers me. And we say, you need to stop, you need to stop triggering me, which means that you're doing something to me. And so you need to stop doing it. And that's the place of victimhood. And by the way, you might need to stop doing that. I'm not saying that, <laughs> you know. But I'm not saying don't, that, that that's not valid. It, it can be valid. But if that's where we stop, we're not taking the question deeper enough. We're not being curious. Because the best question that we can ask when we say, why are you here? What we're really asking is, what can I learn from this? What can I learn from you? If you're triggering me, what can I learn from this experience? Why are you here with this experience? What are you here to teach me? So a couple examples, one I've told a number of times um, is the example where years ago, I was really busy in my life. I was so busy, I didn't have time to do the things that I thought were fun, like watch movies on Netflix and, and other channels. I mean, there's like 80 of them now. Uh, or read novels. You know, I just felt like I was too busy for all of those things. I was busy, busy, busy. And at the same time, I kept waking up at like one, two, three in the morning. And when I'd wake up, I was wide awake, wide awake. And I kept thinking, this is not helping me. I'm already so busy. Now I'm busy and tired on top of everything. <laughs> And so I went to the doctor. Well, first I tried like lavender, chamomile tea, um, you know, everything I could think of. I didn't do warm milk because that just sounded disgusting. <laughs> I, mean, I don't like milk anyway, but then you warm it. <laughs> anyway, so I didn't try that. But I did try like everything else I could think of, you know, and homeopathic stuff that was in the store. Uh, I went to the doctor. I got pills, Ambien. He said, just start with a half. And if that doesn't work, you can do a full. And if that doesn't work, if it really doesn't work, you can do a little bit more. So I started with the half, didn't work. Took the whole one, didn't work. Took two, still woke right up. Wow. And I thought, this is crazy. I mean, what is going on here? And I was like, oh, wait a second. What do I teach all the time? I teach, you should be curious about this. Why are you here? Of course. I took to the journal, dear insomnia, why are you here? I really don't want you here. I'm so tired. I'm so busy. I'm so busy that I can't do all the things that I enjoy already. And now I'm tired. Why are you here? Please leave. Tell me why you're here. Sign my name. Turn the page. Took a breath. Go deeper. Insomnia answers, you're welcome. 
love, insomnia. <laughs> Dear insomnia, I don't think you understood my question. Why are you here? I cannot tell, I cannot stress upon you enough how stressful it is that you wake me up and I'm wide awake and blah, blah, blah. And I went on and on, very long letter, signed, answer me, Joel. Turn the page, breath, go deeper. Dear Joel, we're here because you asked us to be here. Mm. What? I asked you to be here. You complain all the time about being so busy that you don't have time to watch movies or read books. Mm. So we found time in your life. <laughs> have you noticed that from two to four in the mornings, you've been watching those movies you've been wanting to see and you've been reading those books? You're welcome. Ah. Now, that was amazing to me. And it was so great to remember that I needed to do some self-care in my life. I was out of balance. And as soon as I began building that self-care back into my day, guess what happened? Slept like a baby all night long. Didn't need the Ambien. Slept like a baby. That's what being curious can do. It can help you go deeper into your life and to not just be the victim, not just be the person who goes on Facebook saying, why can't I sleep? It's 2 a.m. and I'm on Facebook. Why can't I sleep? Mm -hmm. Instead, we find out what's underneath it. I remember also a number of years ago, now it's probably like 10 years ago, I woke up and I was having one of those days, you know, the those kind of... Uh, funky days does anybody else have funky days besides me yeah you know i was you know i was i woke up on the wrong side of the bed they call it you know i was short tempered everything was bothering me even though they didn't mean to my you know everybody and everything was just bothering me and i went to work and of course everything was happening the subway was late everything it was just one of those days i was out of step with the day sit down in my office and I think, I can't go the whole day like this. Take out the journal, mm -hmm. dear funky day, <laughs> why are you here? And I just, I wrote a letter to the day. And why, what, what, what am I here to learn from this? And you know what it responded? It said, dear Joel, 30 years ago today, your father died. Ooh. And you have some work to do here. Now, I did not remember it. My conscious mind did not remember that day. And certainly I never put together that it was even coming up. It's not something like my family and I talked about, you know, saying, oh, can you believe it's been 30 years? None of that, zero. But my, something in me knew, my body was carrying it. I knew it. So being curious allows us to see what's underneath everything. So that's question number one, why are you here? Or what can I learn? Now, the flip side of that is, it sounds like the same question, but it's the flip of it. So if that's why are you here? The other question, next question is, why am I here? Why am I here? Because I can say, why are you here? Meaning, what do I get from this? But why am I here? Meaning, why am I here right here in this room? And the question underneath that is, what am I here to give? Because it's not always about me, 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 and me getting, receiving. That's only half the dance. We know that. What am I here to give? Here's an example. A few weeks ago, um, my best friend from, from the first 18 years of my life, we were each other's most important person other than our family. He died, 57 years old. He was on his roof, fell off and died. This was at the beginning of this year. He woke up that morning just thinking it was a day and he was trying to save some money by doing the repairs himself. He died. Now he and I had not been in contact for a number of years. For the first 18 years, we were super, super, we were the tightest people with each other. And then life took over and for various reasons. We kind of went our separate way. And I had not been in contact with him for many years, but we were still close. Something in me said, go to the memorial. Now, the memorial was in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. There's no direct flights. So it's a pain in the patootie to get there. <laughs> 
it's ex it was expensive because, you know, last minute flights, right, are really super expensive. And it was like busy at work and all this stuff. And I thought, no, I have to be there. I have to go. I didn't really know why, but I just felt like I had to go. So I went. And here I was in the hotel room in Lincoln, Nebraska, thinking, I'm not sure why I'm here. Because truthfully, we had not been close for many years. I could have done my own thing, you know, to kind of honor him. They were live streaming the event. So I could have either been at the event live streamed. I didn't really know anybody in his life because our lives had taken different turns. So I didn't really know his coworkers or never met his kids or anything like that. So I kept thinking, why am I here? And it's like, wait, why am I here? That's one of my sacred mm -hmm. questions. So walking from the hotel room to the memorial, it was one of my labyrinth, one of my sacred walks. Mm -hmm. And I began it by saying, why am I here? But I said to him, why am I here? Show me why I'm here. And then I went to the memorial. But the whole way I kept thinking, I, why am I here? Walked into the memorial. His widow came up to me and she said, why are you here? And I said, oh, that's a good question. And, you know, I said, here to honor him and support and all that kind of stuff, which was all true. But I didn't really know why. So I stood there and I thought, right, why am I here? Even she's wondering why the hell I'm here. And then I look over and I see his mother. Now, I haven't seen her for many years either, but when we were best friends, we lived across the street from each other, by the way, the, all those years. So we were in each other's house all the time. So I knew her so well back then. So I went over and I sat down. I said, hey, so-and-so, do you mind? I didn't call her so-and-so, by the way. I used her. Wouldn't that be awful? so <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. But, um, I just protect her privacy, wasn't saying her name. So I was saying, hey, uh, do you mind if I sit down with you? And she said, oh, I'm so happy to see you. She said, I'm so glad. Please do sit down next to me. And I said, nobody else is sitting here? And she said, she said, no. She said, um, you know, his wife and his kids, they have each other. And all of his coworkers and friends, they're all sitting together. And my husband died a couple years ago, and she had another son who had also died. Mm. She said, I just, I'm all by myself here at this thing. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm here. Why am I here? Everything clicked into place. Now, by the way, if I had not asked that question, I may not have been open to receiving mm. that kind of answer. Mm. And so I just sat there the whole time present. It's not like we had the, you know, the a revelatory conversation that changed the course of her life. It was one of those things, though, that it was so close and so intimate, just being a presence for her in the time when she was at her darkest. And I thought that is the power of being curious, asking questions. Now, finally, the third question is, how can I find joy here? Because oftentimes we find ourselves in situations or in places where we cannot find the joy in it. Ram Das, the uh, teacher, famous teacher, said this. He said, take what's on your plate and transform it until it feeds you. Mm -hmm. So using that metaphor of a plate of food in front of you. Now, I'm one of those kind of eaters that's called delay gratification eater. So I see the perfect bite on the plate and I save it for last. I start with the thing I want to eat least and eat that first. So the broccoli, gone, done, done first. And I just keep doing that until so that my last bite is the sweetest, best. But thinking of that metaphor that Ram Dass says, if something is on your plate that's not great, like broccoli, how do I make it great? How do I find joy here? How do I make it great? Cheese sauce, that, that helps broccoli. But uh, in life, it's like when there is something that is not sweet, that is not good, that is not tasty in your life, the question becomes, how do I find joy in it anyway? Can I transform it into something? Can I just um, put something with it that makes it better? Or should I just eat it and know that it's good for me? And that sometimes can be enough. And that's joyous in itself. How do I find joy 
here. So here's what being curious does. It takes you off of autopilot in life. We can all be on autopilot. we got a lot going on. We're busy people. But being curious and asking these kinds of questions literally opens you up and engages you in your own life. Isn't that the point? I'm thinking of my friend now that fell off the roof. You know, we got to be engaged in our life, be awake every single day that we can. Um, answering these kinds of questions will open yourself up to new adventures and new ways of being. And you can figure out if you really need to be curious about things, if you have a passion that you haven't followed through enough on yet, follow the passion, ask questions. If there is something you have an aversion to, that's the opposite of passion. Why do I feel an aversion to this? Maybe there's something underneath this. If you um, feel uh, if you feel stuck, bored, blocked, or unseen, use these questions as ways to open up and find your way into the cave where the treasure lies. You can use curiosity to scratch the itch of restlessness and to deal with doubt that you might have. Curiosity takes you on a journey, the greatest journey that we will each take, the greatest adventure ever told, which is your story. Mm -hmm. A life of curiosity is always open. We are always learning because a life of curiosity means we are also always a student of our own life and we are always growing. So let's go within now. And instead of being certain, let's be open and ask questions. Let's just be open to the great questions. Let's allow ourselves to breathe deeply to move into that space of why am I here? What do I need from this today? What do I need? What is this here to teach me, to tell me, to show me and to reveal to me? And how can I in turn give more in this very situation that I'm in, not just this moment, but this life that we have? Where can I find joy where maybe before I thought was joyless or where joy was lacking? I'm going to open myself up and I know this for everyone here that as we connect one breath deeper, we connect to the source of all life, that source that has created this life, the life divine. And as we connect to that life divine, knowing that it is not only in us, it is us and expresses as us, we open ourselves up to being guided and directed every step of the way. Sacred walks, every walk is a sacred walk. Every word is a sacred word, so we open ourselves up to it for greater awareness greater experience, and ultimately greater meaning. Revealed more and more every day. So today we live in those beautiful big questions and we let them be our compass. And we go forth today knowing that this is our path. The path of being open and being open student of life itself. So grateful to know this, so powerful to have a grateful heart, grateful for everything we already know and have, and yet grateful for that urge to move forward as well. Beautiful dance of the divine. Thank you, spirit. Thank you, life. Thank you life itself. And I, as I know this for myself and for everyone listening to these words, I release this into 
with beautiful love and law that is the creative process itself, knowing that we are always connected as we pay attention. Thank you, life. And together we say, and so it is.